California's gold is produced in association with KCET Los Angeles and is seen statewide on California public television. This series is endorsed by the California Teachers Association, the California School Boards Association, and the California Library Association. Hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and here we are on this beautiful springtime morning in Sacramento. Well, actually, we're about 20 minutes east of downtown Sacramento. We've come to the old Mather Field, an old decommissioned airfield here near Sacramento, in search of something that I've been hearing about for years. Now, they come in all shapes and sizes. Part of the year, they're full of water. Other times of the year, they're bone dry. Some of the time, they're filled with beautiful blooming wildflowers and they're home to literally hundreds of different species of plants and animals. In their own way, they're unique to California, and at one time there were literally thousands of them located in our state. Today we're down to just a few precious remaining spots. And if you're curious as to what we're talking about, well, I'll give you a hint, it's not this body of water right here. This is a lake that's full of water all year round. If you're curious where we're going to end up and why we're going there and what makes these places so special, well, as always, you're invited to come on along with us as we continue our search together for California's natural gold. <music> there we were barreling down one of the back roads of Old Mather Field. This was a huge air base with lots of open space. Now the wide expansive grasslands were beautiful on their own, but we were in search of something in the grasslands, things you can't see unless you know what to look for. Because you see this open space was and is the location for one of California's most precious and endangered natural wonders. Like I said, I'd heard about these things for years, but now at long last, I would have the opportunity to see some up close in all their wonder. Well, we have arrived at our destination, this beautiful big grassy area here, and this is where we're gonna find these things we've been looking for all these years. Introduce yourself to everybody because these two ladies are gonna be the people who are gonna take us on the tour. Nice to meet you. My name is Eva Butler, and I'm with the Sacramento Splash Program and a volunteer with the Native Plant Society. Well, that's, a, that's a mouthful right there, but it <laughs> sounds important. And? Hello, I'm Amy Rutledge, Executive Director with the Sacramento Valley Open Space Conservancy. Okay, so we've got our tour guides here. We have some kids from a local school here who are getting ready to search for the th same thing that we're searching for. Tell everybody what it is well, actually, why don't we walk over to the sign? Sure. Because the sign would be a good way of dramatically letting everybody know what it is we're looking for. Sensitive habitat protect our vernal pool grasslands. So we are here in search of vernal pool. Yes, sir. And this is the place to find them here at Mather Field. Okay, now tell us first off what vernal pools are, because I don't think most of us really know. They're the best kept secret in California. <laughs> They're temporary wetlands. They are wet in the winter when we have our rainy season. And because we have our Mediterranean climate where it dries out for eight months, they dry out too. So the vernal pools are a place where in this very flat part of our watershed, water collects in little depressions in the earth and it can't get away because there's hard pan underneath. So it has to evaporate. And so while it's evaporating, it's full of critters. Once it's dry, it fills with flowers. Like today, we're here at practically peak bloom. And then in another two or three weeks, it'll be brown. Look like nothing ever happened here. We'll wait for next year for the rain again. And I think what we're gonna find out during this adventure is why these vernal pools are so important and why they are actually vanishing and why you all are doing this good work 
to keep them here. So let's head out with the kids. Are you all ready to head out too? Oh, you bet. Or are you, you still got a little bit of, uh, of uh, orientation to do? Yeah, we can head out. We're okay. Out. Come on, let's head out and see the vernal pools. Okay, hiking through the, what do you call this? Vernal pool grassland. Vernal pool grassland. We have come upon our first vernal pool. Actually, is this, how does this differ from like a marsh or a wetland or, or whatever else you'd, you'd think this might be? A marsh will have water in it most of the year or all of the year, and a vernal pool has to go dry for at least several months. If, if, this, if a vernal pool got water in the summer, like from runoff irrigation or something, it would turn into a marsh. All the vernal pool plants would, would die and marsh plants would replace them. In fact, that spike rush that you see sticking up, it looks like grass, uh -huh. that's a plant that can live in marshes also. So we only find it in vernal pools that hold water for a long time. And most of the pools around us right now are dry and full of flowers, but this is a big pool and it's drawing water from a big watershed and it stays long, wet longer. Now, is it getting water in it because there's kind of a uh, depression in the land? We're seeing the water because there's a depression. The water, when rain falls on this grassland, it percolates down through the soil and in a vernal pool grassland, it hits hard pan, which is just a layer of minerals, um, something impermeable so the rainwater can't go to the ground and it moves and flows and this is the place that we see it sitting above the water table. Look at this we are literally uh, standing right over a I don't know how you'd describe this it's different from anything I've ever seen before. It, well it is different it's totally unique if you look at the water carefully it's very clear and you'll see uh, little black tadpoles of western toads cruising around in there um, now this is late, this, the season is about over, so m most of the dozens or hundreds of critters that have to have a vernal pool for its habitat, they got started early. You know, and back in February when we had our first rains, it was late this year, and the pools filled and they just get going. Within a couple of days there are bacteria and protozoa cruising around and then little insects hatch. So within... Oh, I've never seen anybody get as excited about <laughs> protozoa. <laughs> I guess it takes a special kind of person to get excited about this, doesn't it? Well, it does, except that when you, when you get close up to these pools like the kids have out here, you really realize how important these are to the overall uh, scheme of animals that live in this habitat, including birds and mammals and other amphibians like salamanders. Now, let's walk down here while you tell me why they are important, because I'm not sure I understand why it's important to have these things here. Well, the, uh, when the rains first hit, you'll see a lot of the shrimp and the smaller bugs coming out. They hatch from cysts that were in the soil all summer, maybe more than one season in baking hot weather that we have here Boy, in the Central I'm, Valley. I'm getting... you, if you get up on the grass, you'll be dry. Yeah. I'm just, <laughs> I like vernal pools, but not that much. I don't think we want to get in it. But I mean... And then other creatures feed on those, so uh, gradually the food chain increases to the point where birds can come in the pools and ah. get protein-rich. Uh, meals, like going to McDonald's for them. I got you. And uh, we have species in the grasslands, the upland areas that you see on the sides here, like the burrowing owl, and uh, larger animals like um, amphibians, like the tiger salamander. And these are threatened species as well as the shrimp in the pools. So, so we have they have to have these things. Boy, I'm back in the water again. That's the lesson you learn early on. It just <laughs> kind of, the water just kind of soaks in the soil. They're saturated all the way up to this. the grass. Wow. Yep. Now, how old is this pool? Let's stand here and look at this for just a minute. Now we're beginning to see the pool itself. How old is this? We estimate at, uh, in this field, these pools are at least 100,000 years old. No. So they've had these species living in them and these flowers blooming for 100,000 years and probably more. Really? Right here, just like this? In fact, I, we think that the vernal pools probably look essentially like they looked long before Europeans came here, whereas the grasslands have changed dramatically in the last 200 years. Most of the species of plants you find here came from other parts of the world. They invaded the native plants that used to live here, but they can't live in a place that tough. 
it's very hard to be adapted to live underwater for four or five months and live in basically a desert for eight months. So they have evolved ways of coping with being dry and being wet, and these plants can't. So they stop right at the edge where, that's how you know to walk along the edge where it's dry, where the grass stops, the vernal pool plants start. And every one of the plants that grows in here, and there, you'll really see some more um, in flower, are, they have to have a vernal pool, they have to have it dry out, and these guys just can't take it, they're just not tough enough. I like this, we're hearing the plane go over, and of course this was a former air base, so you got the new technology flying over this pool that's literally been here just like this for over a hundred thousand years. In fact, we think that the, the uh, hard pan that's here happened because there were volcanoes that erupted, you know, two million years ago, and their ash deposited on this landscape, and the minerals precipitated through the soil and made that hard pan. So we've been building this landscape for millions of years, and a lot of the critters in here, the tadpole shrimp, they, we call them living fossils because they look almost exactly like the fossils we find that are millions and millions of years old. They haven't changed in all that time. That's because they've been protected by the vernal pools. Yep, that's right. And this is a great pool to see um, tadpole shrimp. They're fairly rare. You have to have a big pool that has water for a long time because they need a long time to grow. And in small pools, that water goes away just too fast for them to reach their adult stage. Now, what are these humps that I see all the way through the grassland here? What are they? Well, these are Mima mounds. The uh, what? Mima mounds, M-I-M-A. And Can they're... Can we stand on top of it? <laughs> sure. Um, Mima mounds. Look at this. Now, what is a Mima mound? It's a high spot in the vernal pool landscape, and it's a different kind of soil. Um, it percolate, the water can percolate better through this soil, and so different kinds of plants grow on these Mima mounds than on the rest of the grassland. How did they get here? Do we know what the story is of the Mima mounds? I'm going to pass that on to Eva, actually. <laughs> she's, she's well, let's go stand on another one while we're talking about <laughs> it, because they're everywhere them. around here. <laughs> the, um, there are a lot of theories uh, from just the scouring action of ancestral rivers and streams. You know how they carve the landscape. That's probably what carved the vernal pools. and the Mima Mounds, but uh, I particularly like one myth that's arisen about the peoples who lived here many thousands of years ago. They're, um, they would work all year to bring in food for the winter, and then tribes from across the, uh, in Nevada would come over and steal it. Well, they got good and sick of having their winter stores robbed, so they came up with the idea that they would, um, well, the, really their great spirit came and said to them, it's time to build a wall to keep the marauding tribes out. So all of the, the, uh, the native women picked up burden baskets and kept filling them with soil and dirt and hauling them and making this wall. They did this for so long that eventually they built the Sierra Nevada mountains. And when the wall was done, the great provider said, okay, you've done your work. And they were so exhausted. They dropped their burden baskets full of soil and dirt just where they stood. And that's where the Mima Mounds came from. Good story. 60 plants grow only in vernal pools, and they start growing long before the pool really fills with water. Now I'm seeing some tadpoles in here. Now I'm going to give you a few more. Oh, look, now we're beginning to really see, right over on the edge here, two tadpoles, three tadpoles. And that's a Pacific chorus frog, and that little guy is a western toad, so we have two different species of amphibians. And then these little, these little beautiful um, damselfly larvae are, are only in this pool because this pool lasts a long time. Many pools never have enough water for these guys to live and they'll have, every pool is really different. If I was to sample in one pool after another, I wouldn't Here, find I this, let you all hold this. the si same batch of, um, of critters each time. So every pool is just a, a different habitat. And I guess the question some people would ask though is why is it important to have these things, these uh, I mean, there are tadpoles lots of places, not just in vernal pools. Well, there are, there are, and then there are species that live only here. We have a, a species of toad called a spadefoot, spadefoot toad that lives in some pools over there, and they're the only spadefoot toads anywhere near here. And if it wasn't for the vernal pool, they would not be here at all. So really, you know, I think when people think about, well, what good is a vernal pool? I hear people sometimes say that. 
I think, um, well, if you look at these kids, yeah. it's really good for them in lots of ways. They connect with the place they live, they connect with nature. I think they get to see a water habitat with all the critters it supports the way it should. It's still clean water and it helps them learn lessons about how to keep water clean in other areas. But if we lost, if we lost all the vernal pools, we would lose 60 species of plants. We could add those to the, we have about 1,500 species of plants in California that are in danger of, of going extinct because many of them live in special places like this. So you wipe out the habitat and you wipe out all those species. And many, many of the little critters that live in here don't even have names yet. That's how, how little we know about the system. One of the nice things about being in the vernal pool grassland is you can see a lot of different birds and just if you're quiet you can listen and hear a whole bunch of different things singing. You girls, do you hear that sound? Sort of yes. that bird that's flying off there with the red patch on its wing. Do you know what that one is? The red winged blackbird? That is a red winged blackbird, exactly. Well guess what they've been doing out here? Nesting. Nesting time. Come over here. We're going to be really, if you go around the back side. Oh, look. Oh, one more step and come in close and right down in there, look what she's laid. Four little eggs that are going to turn into red winged blackbirds. So and we, look how it's hidden right in the middle of this clump of flowers. You would never, ever know it was there. And guess why Mama Bird put it there? just so you couldn't find it. Many of the birds here, the, the western meadowlark, the red-winged blackbird, uh, are, they actually nest right on the ground, the killdeers, and they make nests and their bodies blend in with the surrounding uh, grasslands so they can't be seen. So it's a pretty, it, it works pretty well for them. They have all kinds of behaviors they've, they've evolved to keep their predators away. Um, and hiding well, now, things is the best. Now are all of these kids here today, they're not predators. Well, we, we all are predators. We all eat. Everybody's part of a food chain somewhere. And the kids look in the vernal pool and they see a food web that's incredibly complex. But one of the things that this program brings home to them is that we all live in this world and it is a complex place and what we do affects these things. Yeah. So they learn ways to keep water clean. There's Mama Bird flying around. I think she wants she us to get out of town. She is not happy <laughs> that we're here and I don't blame her. We're going to leave her nest and her eggs alone. Look at the flowers. They're everywhere. Yeah, it's a beautiful display. And the really beautiful thing about vernal pools, besides the fact they harbor native flowers, which is really special, is that they have rings of flower color. And uh, different times of year, just through their blooming cycle over about a three or four week period, you'll see different colors coming out in the pools. Now White look at this. This is literally a ring right here. So at not that long ago, let's walk out in the middle of it. This would have been full of water. That's right. Here. That's right. Right, and, and as, it, as the water recedes, you can see the first place that's left dry is the edge. Yeah. So the plants that live up there are the ones that, that want to be, you know, want to start growing soonest. And the things that live down in the bottom are used to being underwater longer. Oh, look, we've got all kind of rocks here, too. So this really would be right in the center of the pool right here. Yeah, that's right. And the, uh, there's various different kinds of white and yellow flowers that bloom in vernal pools. The small white flower that's kind of carpeting the bottom is Navarisha. And the uh, yellow flowers that you see predominantly spreading across the pool are gold fields. And they're actually sort of the signature flower of vernal pools because they are so visible from a distance and the ring colors. You know, I feel terrible just stepping on any of these flowers. Is we, it okay for us to be in here? I feel we, like I'm almost on sacred ground. We are on sacred ground and we never come into the middle unless we, oh. have, a, we, have, unless we have a good reason and showing people vernal pools I think is a great reason. Look at this. It's like it's carpeted with these little white, very delicate flowers. Right. That place you're standing now, you notice you've got a little spike rush around you like we saw in the big wet pool. This, that's because this was the deepest, wettest part of the pool. So, so this is what we saw coming out of the top of the water in the wet pool. Right, well, it's a long, wet period. And look at this. Here is the, the white flower. Then you come 
to the little yellow flowers, and then you come to the big yellow flowers. And what, and what you can miss easily is in here are little tiny purple flowers, the down inches. There's more down in the middle of the pool, but as you look closer, you find more and more species so that at first you don't notice these woolly marbles, but if you look close, then you start to see more and more. And the little pollinators, you notice all the little bees and flies? They've got just about a week or two to collect pollen to raise their young. So they're out here when the flowers they like to pollinate and get pollen from are, are out. So there's a whole chain going on here. If you don't have the flowers, you don't have the bees. And if you don't have the bees, you don't have the flowers. Yeah, and many organisms will come after the pools are dry. You know, these plants have one job, and that's to leave seeds for the next generation. So they're all struggling right now to get bloomed, pollinated, and make their seeds before all the water's gone. But what they're going to leave behind is food for all those little pocket gophers and voles and uh, critters that we saw in the uplands. They come down to feed because this will be like a little basket of food all late summer and fall. When to us it looks dead, it's dinner. So it's, it's really providing for species not just in the pool but in the surrounding grasslands as well. It just keeps getting better because as you get out into this grassland, then you really begin to see all of these inventions you were talking about that are vernal pools. Yep, and here we're going to walk over a Mima Mound to get That's there. That's right. You never run out of surprises in a vernal pool grassland. Now this uh, is even prettier than the last one. You betcha. And it has some plants in it that we didn't see in the last one. Boy, this is just beautiful. Ha! Ah, who's this over here? This is Carol Witham. Uh, Carol is, I consider to be one of the um, experts on vernal pools in the state of California. She's out here, uh, she's been working on a research project that she might be able to tell you about. Is this just a coincidence we ran into you here today? <laughs> Actually, it pool is a expert. coincidence. Let's stand over here in the pool okay. because this is just, you know, for us, this has been an amazing uh, discovery. And I think we are probably representative of most Californians who don't know a darn thing about vernal pools. Well, it's pretty surprising in that vernal pools only occur I mean, they occur in a lot of places in California, but you only notice them when they're in bloom. And that's always a very short, very ephemeral period of time every spring. And so if you're not lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, um, this would just look like a dry grassland to you. And we're losing most of these, aren't we? Yes, we are. We're losing vernal pools in California um, every day. Um, what percentage of the original vernal pools are still left? There's a lot of controversy over that. Um, a lot of scientists have different ideas. Generally, um, a very conservative estimate is there may be 25% left. The rest of us think there may only be 10% left. Really? Yes. So they're being eaten up by development? They're being eaten up by? Agricultural conversion is a big one, particularly vineyards. Um, drip irrigation ended up being something that uh, um, allowed people to actually plow and plant um, trees and vines on land that was otherwise not, you couldn't irrigate it, so. And again, we're hearing the plane come over and that reminds us of the fact that this was a, an airfield and the fact that this was a government property and kind of cordoned off is probably what saved these over the years. The vast majority of the vernal pools that are saved in California right now were either military bases or very large private um, ranching operations. Some of the best vernal pools in California are private ranching operations. Now we can't see all the vernal pools in California. Let's stand out in the middle of this one. How does this one compare? Are we getting a good vernal pool experience right You're here? We're getting an outstanding vernal pool experience today. Well, it couldn't have been a better day. I have literally heard about these vernal pools for years and I'm not alone, am I? It's amazing how many people have never even heard the word vernal pools, much less had the experience you've had today. Yeah, of seeing these things. They are so special, but like Carol said, you have to be here at the right time. Yeah. It's the, uh, the bloom, this bloom you're seeing, this is peak bloom, and I need you to know this is not a particularly good bloom. This wasn't a great year for vernal pools. Really? It should have been here last year. Boy, look at this. I gotta tell you, this is an amazing sight. 
people are beginning to wake up and realize just what it is we're losing. And that's why the, you know, the California Native Plant Society, our mission is to educate people because we feel as education is the best way to help foster conservation. Well, you've educated us today and done a real good job on it. These pools have been here for literally hundreds of thousands of years, just like this. They are dwindling quickly in our state but with education and enlightenment, we'll be able to save the pools that remain so that these pools, just like these students, will be part of California's future. The pools are not just part of our past. They'll be here preserved they are for precious. future generations. They're precious. You know, we talk about California's gold. This is where I think a lot of it is. <laughs> right in these pools. Yeah. You said it very well. These are fine examples of California's gold. Hope you've had as much fun today as we have. It's been a glorious day. Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed this adventure. If you'd like to see it again or share it with your family or friends, or perhaps donate a copy to your local school or library, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727 and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.